This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found on Gadget Geek show number 409, recorded on July 18th, 2019. Here at Home Gadget Geeks, we cover all the favorite tech gadgets that find their way into your home. News reviews, product updates, and conversation, all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Collison, broadcasting live from the AverageGuy.tv studios here in a super, super hot. We've had 100, Mark, I, I can't do this in Celsius, but it's been 100, 101, 102, hot again tomorrow, super hot. You guys you guys getting heat up there, up there oh, yeah. in Canada? We're, we're in a heat warning right now. It's uh, 91 tomorrow, feels like 106. 91 Saturday, feels like 108. Oh, yikes. Yeah. A lot of humid. You guys get a lot of humidity. I think you're in the same plains as we are, right? You're just farther north. Yeah. Yeah. We're, uh, we're one up. We're one time zone different. We got okay. uh, 15 degrees of humidity right now. Ooh. Scheduled for tomorrow. 15. That's not too bad. It's enough. It's not. <laughs> we're not into the bad stuff yet. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. We're so Celsius. It's gonna be 33. Feels like 41. The bad days are when it's sort of 38. Feels like 49. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, lot of, like, that's a lot of humidity. And it's over 100 without humidity. Right. Do you? Are you guys Eastern or are you eastern. Mountain? You're Eastern. Okay, so yeah. you're farther. You're farther to the east than yeah. we are. Well, we will post a show. I know I told you last week I'd have transcripts for you, but for some reason the longer version of the transcripts we kind of broke Otter.ai, and I didn't know if it was the week, and I messed around with it all weekend, and I couldn't get it working right, and it was doing some weird things with the timestamps and. I didn't know if it was me, it was them. I submitted a ticket. It just, I never got it working. And then of course the week started and I never got it done. So we'll try again for this week, full show notes. We'll have a full copy of the transcripts if you want to go out and see them. See, uh, well, I've gotten some really good feedback on it. So you can see, get it at the average guy.tv. In this case, go the average guy.tv slash HGG 409. Uh, we'll get you there as well. And love to have you do that. Don't forget, you can listen to us on our mobile app, a great way to listen. Tonight, I'm going to be honest, Mark's going to show a ton of pictures. So you may want to either go and if maybe you've already subscribed to the RSS feed for the video, if you've done that already, you can watch it that way or catch us on YouTube. And uh, it's a great way to do it. While you're on YouTube, just hit the subscribe button. That way, you know, every time I post a video, you get notified. You don't have to come and get it, but it's the easiest way to know. It also shows up in your alerts and all that other stuff when it goes. So it's just kind of a great way to stay on top of it. And a link to that is in the show notes as well. Don't forget, don't forget as well to join us in our Discord group if you want to do that. Theaverageguy.tv slash Discord. All right, Mark Robson is back with us tonight. Mark, thanks for saying yes and uh, coming on the show. Welcome. Thank you. Good to be back. Uh, good to have you. Uh, we don't have Mike Howard with us tonight. Um, sadly, Mike is very, very sick. He, he announced, and I mentioned this at the end of the show, but I wanted to just announce it up front. Mike's a good friend of the show and has done a lot and come on a lot. And is, I think over the last three years, Mark, has always been your partner for this kind of twice annual segment that we do uh, around grilling. But uh, Mike has gotten uh, cancer and he's, he's had this before. We, If you guys remember, he had this on the back of his head and they removed it and thought we were he was done. And that same form of cancer has returned to other parts of his body. So Mike, he's being very forthright about it on Facebook, by the way, no secret here. And I'm just saying what I've seen him post to his public sections on Facebook, but Mike, we're pulling for, for you. He, he probably doesn't have time. He starts chemo tomorrow. I think Mar, uh, Mark is what he said. Um, so the first one's not as bad. It gets worse from what I understand from there. And, uh, but very, I think very beatable and uh, we're pulling for you um, all the way, Mike. So, um, you know, do well and, uh, and heal up and uh, hopefully we'll get him back. Maybe by this time next year, he'll be all healed back up and, uh, and back on the show. Mark, we, when I pinged you about this, you said like, I haven't really bought much gear. And then we started talking about it and you had probably bought some gear. I bought some. Uh, yeah. You've bought some gear associated with it. Um, first off, uh, you've taken, I asked you like, well, you took a few classes and you're like, yeah, a few, how many do you think in the last year or two, how many classes have you participated in around grilling? 17, 16. I've taken 13 through one clock, 13 through one company and four through another. And are most of them just like cooking? Is that what you, is that what you go to do to kind of learn how to do it or? Well, the four, it, the four that I took, so 
if you see the picture right now, there's a, the, the joke about the apron. Uh, this is the most expensive apron I've ever bought because this is what I got after taking 12 classes at about 120 bucks a piece. <laughs> so it's a pretty expensive apron. It's a pretty expensive apron. Yeah. Fantastic classes. These things are um, they're three to four hours a class. Uh, they're licensed, which up here means that they actually serve you beer and wine as you're cooking. Um, so when you figure it's $125, it's a three-hour class. They're feeding you. You you never walk away hungry, and you're getting uh, booze at the same time. Yeah. It's not a not a bad night. It's kind of a date, right? I mean, it's kind can, of a date for yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of, um, kind of nice to. Do Do you ever take the other the other one along with you? I've, we've done two classes together, I think, and we've done a Valentine's Day class. Nice. So they had a Valentine's Day dinner, which was like a full gourmet dinner that you cook together. Yeah. I think there was ten people doing that, and uh, just wait. I made a comment to the chefs afterwards. There was way too much food. There was so much food that we couldn't. Like, you're just rolling out of there. <laughs> So we, we checked in with the local community college uh, last time we had you on the show last spring or fall. I can't remember if we had you in the spring or not, but um, I checked into the community college because I thought for my anniversary, I was going to do that. And man, I waited, uh, you know, I, I was checking four or five weeks out and I had waited too long. Everything, we have this great brand new culinary school through our local community college. I mean, brand new building, they, they are really working it there at the community college. So if you're thinking about you're listening tonight and you hear some great recipes and you're like, man, how could I take advantage of this in my area? One, check your local community college. They may be offering some some of these classes, but Mark, they were full. Like I couldn't yeah. get in until like, this was January. I couldn't get into like May. I was like, yeah. this doesn't well, work. Pretty popular, it, right? It's getting, it's getting to be. Um, the Ottawa classes aren't as busy as the Toronto classes. Toronto has, is four times the size of the people. So the, the store down there tends to be busier. Um, but like, I'm just looking to find, if you pull up the screen again, I'll show you a couple yeah. of meals that we actually, a couple of the dishes we had at the, um, so that was one dish we had, which was, uh, I think lobster tails and steak, um, fresh mackerel or fresh fish. I can't remember what the fish was. This is all for the Valentine's day dinner, mm. uh, chicken and a fresh salad that we made, uh, dipped chocolate, uh, strawberries. And then they did the whole thing up a little. That's our neighbors that did it with the class. But it was a uh, like it was a whole. It was a four hour class, I think, for that. And I think it was two hundred and fifty bucks each, or no, per couple for for the couple. Yeah, that's not that's pretty. I mean, Canadian. Yeah. Well. Okay. So yeah. Better. So two hundred bucks U.S. Yeah. Maybe right. Right. If you think about um, it that way. A little bacon wrap breeze to start off with. Uh, I think the three appetizers, four proteins, and two salads or something. It was it was just huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and you, you you mentioned almost too much food. You get to take some home if you. Not that one, uh, okay. but other ones. Like I've had other class where I took home a half pound of steak cooked because it was just they had fifteen pounds of meat for eight people. Yeah, so it, it's uh, yeah, it's good. Um, gadget wise, I'm gonna have to. I still I need to schedule some. I, it, it's a reminder. I think maybe I'll start scheduling them for the fall. My daughter will go back to school. It'll just be the two of us. I think I'll start scheduling them for the fall um, to do that. You picked up a portable wood fired outdoor pizza oven uh, recently. Yeah. Um, have you done? Have you been firing pizza other ways or? I've um, yeah, I've done them. Um, while the pictures up, I'll see if I can find them. Um, this was homemade pizza on my acorn. Um, I've had my acorn hot enough that it actually burnt the wood handles off the bottom of the ash, ash pan. <laughs> um, that was another night we did fresh pizzas on the acorn. So that thing's getting to 7, 800 degrees. Yeah. Uh, fresh dough from a local uh, Italian bakery that you can go by there and buy fresh dough already made up and you make your own pizzas. Um, that's not one. I'm trying to find my pizzas. There we go. That's... So that's uh, another one that we made from scratch. And I have a friend that owns a, um, a guy I know in Picton, which is near us, owns a, a winery and he's a certified pizzaiola from Naples. And he was actually looking at it, looking at my pizza and saying, that looks good. He says, you just need to get a little bit hotter to be able to get it perfect. And this guy has a like a 1500 Fahrenheit pizza oven. So um, I this the one you've picked up, This yeah. is it Uni? Uni, uh, yeah. O-O-N-I-3 portable. So the one I have is a two. They changed it a little bit. Okay. Um, those sell in Canada. They sell for about five hundred bucks a piece. I had picked up a pizza kit for my Weber kettle that I hadn't used yet. 
and I saw this guy selling this this pizza grill or pizza oven for two hundred dollars. And I'm like, yeah, two hundred bucks. I, I don't need it. I already have a, a pizza grill for my Weber. I already do pizzas on my acorn. And then two weeks later, he's selling for fifty bucks. I'm like, okay, forget it. I gotta get it. <laughs> so we did uh, we did pizzas a couple of weeks ago. Um, they're not showing up yet in the feed. That's okay. Uh, did, here, here, I'll th I'll throw them up for you. There you go. Yeah, the uh, the recent uh, food. So it was just uh, we just got some little pre-made crusts and we tossed them into the thing, and that was that pizza was cooked in thirty seconds. Uh, 90 seconds. Wow. So it's 800 and some odd degrees when you're cooking it. Mm -hmm. That's so, off this wood fired. Yeah. Pizza oven. Yeah. And about where, 15, do you, where do you put the wood in at? So if you want to pull that picture back up again, yeah, yeah. the uh, uh, link you just let's had. Bring it, there we go. So you see where that handle is at the back? Yeah. Here uh, no, keep going right the other way. That one? Nope. Uh, keep going down. Okay. The handle at the back. So, well, uh, hold on. There we go. Handle in the back. I'm trying to move my. I'm trying to show up my mouse, but it's not oh. working. <laughs> so you, have a, you have a wood handle at the front, and you have a, a big smokestack at the front. Yeah. And then at the back of the unit, you have a little wooden handle sticking up. Mm -hmm. That's where the wood pellets go in. Okay. Oh, it's yeah. pellet fired. It burns pellets. Okay. So the you light the pellets back there. Um, the flame goes forward, goes up, and across the top of it, and goes out the stack at the front. Okay. And it uses probably a pound of pellets over a half hour cooking. So they're not, not that bad. But you could, I mean, for one pizza, is it worth it to fire it up for one pizza? I mean, that's all it seems like a lot of work just for it to cook for 90 seconds. It's, yeah, I'm going to fire it up when I want to do what I want to do, right? It's, it's, if we're making a special night of it and making all the homemade pizzas, we'll do it. Um, the other night I fired up a Traeger and put a, a frozen pizza on it. <laughs> so it's it took it uh 25 minutes or so but it was yeah, right um but you fire this thing up when you want the good pizza okay like when we make take the time to make our own homemade crust and, and you're it, it's uh it doesn't take long to cook it it takes 15 minutes but it's, it's more the experience right yeah 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 well and the um, taste too i mean it, it's phenomenal wood, wood fired pizza is really really good yeah now when we cook on the charcoal acorn we're still getting wood fired pizza too right but that was taking an hour and a half to get up to that type of temperature. Like I would let that thing run. Uh, yeah. Anybody who has an acorn knows that these things run hot. And I would just let this thing run flat out for an hour and a half to get that temperature. But it made beautiful pizzas. And this this one, this the the Uni three. Yep. Two, I'm seeing 275 here in the U.S. shipped. Yeah. Shipped. I love it. it says shipped mainland U.S. <laughs> and, well, they come uh, from uh, U.K. Right? Are they? I think the site's okay. it's a European company. It's either okay. I thought it was uh, Sweden, but the site pulled up today was UK, was UK something. Can so, you run any pellets in it, or do you have to buy special pellets to get it done? Anything you can find. Okay. And there, do you have, you have a flavored? Do you do the flavored ones or just straight straight pellets? I'm on a Facebook group uh, that we do a lot of discussions about um, air quotes, sort of like heating pellets versus non heating pellets. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, the grill manufacturers want you to use their pellets the same way that HP wants you to use their ink. Right. Right. Um, Tra Traeger's famous for this, right? Everybody, every single yeah. one of them is. Yeah. Okay. Um, the issue you run into is that uh, North America tends to be very uh, lawsuit happy. So everybody's trying to sue somebody over something. There is not one definition of food grade in the government handbooks anywhere. So in the food uh, FDA or in the forestry manuals, there's no um, there's no definition of food grade pellet. There is definitions on what you need to do for uh, wood pellets, and they have to be virgin wood, and they have all these other strict, uh, stringent rules around them. But there's nothing that differentiates a food grade pellet. So all these people say you can't use heating pellets in in uh, pellet grills or pellet device like this. If you know the source where they come from, so mine come from a hardwood mill. The hardwood mill makes hardwood floors, so they're doing birch and maple and oak and sometimes walnut and sometimes cherry. That's the source of the sawdust they use for the pellets. Mm. And then when they go through the pellet to make them, they use pressure to, to um, it's the lignetics in the wood that actually binds the wood together. Lignin in the wood binds the wood together. And they do that by putting massive, something like 25,000 pounds of force behind this wood sawdust. Wow. That's what binds it together. 
yeah. and they use um, food grade grease on the pellet machine. Okay. So they're not a food grade pellet, but I buy uh, six dollars for twenty for six dollars for a forty pound bag versus a dollar ten a pound. Yeah. Buy it locally? Do you go to their yeah. shop to get it? Is that what you do? Well, no, they, there's a mill and then they ship it. it. The guys that buy it from are actually, um, uh, they provide pellets to guys who use pellet stoves in their houses okay. to heat the house. Yeah. yeah. So they're buying 10 at a time. So I go and buy 240 pounds for 40 bucks. And if I'm doing burgers or sausages or dogs or regular stuff, I just throw those into it. If I'm doing a nice brisket, then I'll throw a bag of pecan or, or cherry or whatever I'm going to. So I do a mixture of both, but it cuts down my pellet cost by half. Yeah. Yeah. And as much as you use, that makes sense. A Andrew says in the chat room, you need 240 volt pellets if it's British and one 120 volt uh, if you're in North America. <laughs> that's good. Andrew. Yeah. And then metric versus imperial. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we got that one. We got that one right there. That's that's metric pellets. <laughs> <laughs> that's super good. That is super good. Do you think... Like, so if I were, I'm in Omaha, do you think from a pellet perspective, if I hunted around here, I would find maybe, a, a, I, I go to Menards, I can buy big bags of them at Menards, right? Our kind of big box store. Yeah, I can bags. find big bags for not a lot here. Is that's probably the best place to get them, you think? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if you can get a Dick's, uh, Dick's Sporting Goods. Okay. Um, they're blowing them out for 10 bucks for a 40 pound bag. Okay. Why would, why would dicks be do they sell grills yeah do they okay i think so okay i, I don't again I'm not, I'm not down there so i don't see yeah, it yeah. but i yeah, see yeah. the the deals that the that you guys get a lot that's part of the issue up here so i bought uh 240 pounds of pellets in april from the states brought them over the border so buying them bulk was a couple of the guys we bought 1.2 tons <laughs> um, between four guys bring them over the border pay the duty, pay the, the gas to go down to the border. It was still half the price what I paid from up here. Oh man. So I buy the, and they're lumberjack pellets. They're a good pellet. They're all hardwood. They're all uh, virgin hardwood. Um, so buying those and then buying the, the, the so-called heating pellets that are a, what everybody else calls a competition blend because they're mostly maple oak and I can't remember what the third wood is, but it was, it's just, it's another, I think it's birch um, for just general heat. And if I want to put some flavored smoke onto it, I'll, I'll throw in some of my better pellets and a smoking tube, or um, I put a smoking tube in the link. Um, it, it reduces the, like I'm buying 600 pounds of pellets a year. It's, it cuts the cost down in half. Is this the one you're saying you're putting a, a smoking tube? Is this the one yep. you're talking about? That's yep. so I'll, use that with my, I'll use that with any of my grills to actually do smoking. And I'll also smoke cheese with it. So when it gets to colder temperatures, you put you fill that up with pellets, excuse me, and then you put some cheese um, in it for about three or four hours in your grill and any grill. Oh, and then you put the cheese in the uh, fridge for six weeks or so, and then you have smoked cheese at home. Okay, and but no fire, just the fire that's a part of the. It just it just glows like an ember. Right. Yeah. yeah, just the just the fire. And now this is one of these these because I bought the tube, the amazing yeah, same tube. Idea. Right? Yeah, this is though if like because that tube only really lasts when i do turkey that tube really only lasts an hour to be honest burns These through lot of hours yeah because it's a long it's it's three tubes right it's a snake yeah it's it's not enclosed but it's kind of a it's kind of a snake that goes through so do you light you just light one end and you then light both, depending okay. on how much smoke you want okay so if you want to heavily smoke cheese you can light both of them have it smoke for six hours and you're you're done yeah, and what would if I lit, if I lit this? What kind of in a typical grill? And it was just this. What kind of temperature do, would the the inside of that get up to? Typically, it, it doesn't. It's, it's non-existent. It's Not at all. Be, okay. Yeah, okay. You might raise the, the ambient by maybe ten degrees, yeah. but you tend to smoke cheese sort of October, November, right? So I smoked uh, I think four, six pounds in mid-November for Christmas. So the, the trick to it is you don't, it tastes bitter when you first eat it. So right. you, you smoke it, you um, freezer bag it, and you put it in the fridge for six weeks. Okay. So it was definitely, we're definitely going to do it again. Well, I'll have to, you know, I was, uh, the, the last experience, so Mike, last time Mike Howard was on, and you guys, I, you, you talked me into that, the tube. 
and yep. I set it on the end of the grill, side of the grill, when I do turkey, and um, you know that it works perfectly. I can't get my grill low enough to really smoke anything else, right? A regular, even at just on one side of the burner, all the way down, it still just gets a little too warm uh, in there for a lot of things. But I've noticed that too, especially with the turkey. I do the turkey for three or four hours, and I have to fill that tube up. In fact, I was doing. I think we were doing steaks and I was doing some corn and some other things that were going to be on a while. I put the tube on, took the tube out and set it on top of my deck uh, railing and d- didn't even think like it's well, got hot I'm... embers in there. Yeah. And I left it there for a little bit. And then I was like, oh, crap. I noticed and I picked it up and it had burnt a nice little, a nice little divot. Well, that uh, might be why your tube isn't lasting. Cause it's, um, I'm getting about four or five hours on my tube. So you think I'm getting it too hot? Yeah. Yeah, okay. like if I let, if I let mine, the thing will smoke. I don't fill it up all the way. If I'm okay. doing something like ribs and I want to smoke it for the first couple hours when I'm smoking it, because after a certain point, the smoke won't penetrate the meat. Yeah, just like a 12 inch. I'm talking just like a 12 yeah. inch tube, right? You're, yep. you're getting four or five hours off. Of it. So yeah, I I may be getting that thing too too smoky. Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, it's, I think you get too much heat coming from the barbecue. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, I got gotcha. you. So it's making gotcha. an environment where it wants to burn. So I probably need to get it higher in the grill somewhere, right? Yeah, or if you're or only away. using one burner, like a, how many burners do you have in your grill? Well, I have two. I have so two. If you're, if you, okay. How how cold can you get it, or how cool can you get it with one, bur- one burner? Two, but two something, two and some change. So maybe? put the put the uh, put the yeah. one burner on low, and put the smoking tube on top of the other burner at the other okay. edge of the grill. Okay. Okay. That or just all help. the way, or all the way to the edge. Yeah. Right. I just put it, I put it kind of all the way to the edge. It gets a little air that way. And then it smokes, it smokes the rest of the grill. Okay. Well, that's good lesson learned. Cause I, I, I've been burning, like I get my torch out, get that thing going, blow on. I mean, I really get it because I, I'm afraid it's going to go out. Yeah. It, it won't. It okay. typically won't. Yeah. I've had mine go out once. Um, I usually set it up with, um, I put, I put a propane torch line on the side with the flame pointing out to about five minutes, let it get nice and red and hot. Um, turn the flame off, let the thing burn for another couple minutes, and then blow it out and put it in. Okay. Well, let it go. Okay. I'll have to give that, I'll have to give that a try. We're on a little bit of a cooking hiatus, uh, with it being so freaking hot outside. Uh, this, this is the amazing smoker hot. It, so basically I'd get even more time on this one if I yeah. filled that up, lit it at the end, let it just roll through basically what it does. It just gave everybody a seizure by doing that. But um, okay. well, I know guys that take those on a gas grill and put them underneath the grate, not on, on the opposite side of the hot burner. Okay. So you still get your full surface. Well, it's a good idea. And okay. I'll get in the smoke. Light it, get it going, put the grate back on top, put everything in there, shut it. Okay. Yep. Okay. And is it a problem? You know, I'm using a traditional grill for this and it's got openings on the sides and in the back. Is that a problem for the smoke process? If the it's classes I've taken, they've done a lot of stuff like that. We've even smoked salmon for, um, we did a uh, smoked salmon sausage one time and we smoked the salmon in one of those grills. The, uh, the class I'm taking, the class they take, there's only, there's two charcoal and one pellet and everything else is gas grills. So it's more of a generic grilling classes for the most part than it is a, um, a specialized smoker and charcoal okay. class. Okay. Um, partly because there's not enough people doing charcoal and, and pellet to justify it. Yeah. Like if, if you look at the audience we have, probably 90% of the people don't have a smoker. Yeah, no. And, and Mark, I was thinking of buying one of those, you know, $200 cabinet style, you know, looks like a small beer fridge and they're electric uh, with, with, uh, you use the discs or I guess some of them are pellet as well. Right. I thought about going that direction just to kind of get going. Here's my concern. So I was looking at Traeger's and I'm like, Uyghur says, okay, you definitely want the largest one you can get. Like, you know, a couple shows ago. That's a grand. That's maybe yeah. 1300 bucks. And I'm thinking, I mean, I can't, it's tough to justify that kind of money for, uh, I don't, I don't smoke that much. Buy yourself a Weber kettle. Yeah. Cause then you can smoke, you can grill, you can play with charcoal again. You can play with fire. Well, and well, in, in maybe something like this, if I put this in the middle, right. If I put the smoker in the middle and put the 
briquettes around it and kept that temperature down, right? I could smoke, I could smoke that way as well, right? On a, on a Weber kettle. Well, you wouldn't, yeah. So I've done, I can do smoking on any of my grills I have. Right. So I started off by an, an acorn that a couple of people in the group have. Um, I then went and bought a Weber kettle, which has its benefits over the acorn. Some disadvantages do it. It goes through a lot more charcoal because it's a single layer metal. Right. But it's a bigger surface area. So what I do when I'm smoking on the on the kettle is I put two bricks right inside the base of the kettle. I put a full chimney of charcoal on the back side of the bricks. I toss a couple of wood chunks on top of it. And I have the whole rest of the area for the uh, for the meat. And the smoke goes up, goes across the meat, and then goes out the vent. So that's the, the cheapest way to get into smoking is buy yourself a Weber kettle. Yeah. But I would need a, something to put the pellets in to smoke with. And then I would be. No, you feed... buy wood chunks. Oh, you wouldn't do use it that it. way. Okay. Yeah. But I could, right? I could do the same you thing. Could, you could. I'd, yeah. I'd put the pellets down on the very first with the briquettes. Yep. So you put the. And I use, I use lump. I don't use briquettes, but okay. um, it's personal preference. So Fine, if you can picture the, the, the yeah. round disc of the Weber, I put bricks on one half of uh, one quarter of it and i put all my charcoal behind that lit so i fill it take a full chimney toss all my charcoal behind there toss whatever wood i want on top of that or you can put the tray underneath it right. and then you use all the rest of your space for for your food and then you just make sure the vents on top of the food on the back side of the, of the uh, opposite side of the charcoal yeah so it's pulling up you and you would open the bottom vent as well on that, and then pull yeah. through, or and then yeah. So it goes it goes up from the bottom. It's going to go through the through the uh, smoking basket and through the charcoal. Um, then the smoke, if the smoke's on, underneath the food, it's going to go directly above it. If the wood chunks are what's causing the smoke, the draft is going to pull it out across and up. Okay. When I first started <laughs> smoking, I, I had a smaller Traeger and I didn't have enough room to do all the ribs I was doing for dinner. So I did two racks on the Traeger and two racks on the Weber kettle. <laughs> well, you've, you've last fall, I almost had a brand new Weber from target at the end of the season, they were clearancing them out. I saw it. It was the one that in, in I had been looking locally, you know, 50 to a hundred bucks. You even, it was so funny. You even found some for me. And said, you know, <laughs> hey, get this one. I never did it. I, uh, I, I, yeah. Try Facebook Marketplace. No, no, right on, right on. Yeah, picking up somebody else's. No, I need to. I need to. The the question is just kind of been. Sarah's not a big fan of smoke, and I am. And so, the 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 uh, the, the demand is just not there all the time, you know. And so it's like, how much am I going to really do this? So it, it keeps it keeps getting me thinking. Okay, I just need to figure out a way to do this on my current grill, right for me. And I don't need that much space, though. And I could actually or use, you use both grills. Yeah, no, <laughs> you're you're a bad you're a bad influence on me, Mark. <laughs> I, had a, I had a guy at a barbecue class one time. I tell him I did a prime rib, and I seared it on my acorn at 450 degrees, and then I put it onto my trigger and I smoked it at 180 or 190 until it was done. And the guy looked at me and says, "Yeah, but you're using two grills then." I said, "Yeah, but I have four. So <laughs> yeah, so it's only half of them." I'm only using half my grills. <laughs> There's no, it's irrelevant how many grills I use if the food turns out work. No, if it turns out, if it turns out great, uh, you really, you just really don't care. When I do a tomahawk, I use, um, I smoke it on my rec tech, which is a pellet grill. And then I fire up my acorn and I caveman it right on my uh, coals on the acorn. It, it just, yeah, I use two of them for different reasons. The rec tech doesn't do a high here seat, a high uh, high heat sear as well as putting it right on charcoal does. Yeah. 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 Tony, Tony says in the chat room, it's like computers. You never can have too many. Yeah. I have that problem too. He's probably, he is probably right. Let's, um, let's transition a little bit. Let's talk uh, a little food. You've been doing some, I asked you to kind of bring some recipes to have ready. This is the part of the show. I'm going to just full-time switch over to your uh, to kind of your pictures, Mark, but, um, yeah. um, you've, you've done some really delicious things. The very first one on the list is pork belly, Asian noodle salad. That doesn't sound like a grill dish, but apparently it is. Uh, the pork belly was, so I cooked the pork belly on the, um, I should have done an album of pictures, but I didn't know what pictures. Were no, that's okay. That's all right. So that was tonight's dinner. And that was, um, that's Asian noodles with some 
ready-made uh, bagged broccoli slaw. But on top of that is uh, chunks of pork belly that we uh, cooked for seven hours on Sunday. Um, and then made it just with a peanut sauce. So you can find all sorts of recipes for peanut sauce and uh, a little bit of um, Asian cilantro. And, and uh, it was, I tell my wife tonight, it's a barbecue dish that doesn't taste like barbecue. Yeah, no, delicious. When you, when you think about, okay, so you said seven hours on Sunday. Yeah. So you obviously got to plan this out a little bit, right? I didn't. I actually I pulled it out of the freezer at eight o'clock in the morning, put it on the frost plate for an hour, tossed them on frozen, waited till they actually I could actually pull them apart because they were frozen together. So I cooked them until I could pull them apart, brought them in the house, seasoned them up, put them back on the grill for another five and a half hours. And when you say put it back on the grill, which grill did you put it on? A trigger pellet okay. grill. In, which in is an outdoor oven. It's, yeah, right. So you're outside, right? Or it's, no, it's running outside, right? It's running outside. I was doing, I went and did groceries. I went for a bike ride. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're comfortable enough just letting that thing run. So on the Traeger, you're going to set a temperature, right? So in this case, you're going to set it to about 200. 250, and, I think it was. Okay. And just, and just let it go for seven hours, basically. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, probe it about five, six hours in to see what temperature is. And it was about 190, 190-ish and pulled it off when it's 205. That's what I got to get better at is my internal temp for the grill. So my in my grill, the temperature thing is at the top. But yeah, that's use that. Yeah, you but, really need a you need a you really need a grill level temperature, don't you? You you want to put the temperature if you're cooking to a temperature you're cooking at a temperature. You need to know what the temperature is at the food. Right. Okay. Um, which is why so, like so my basic typically smaller, hotter typically hotter at the grill than it is at the top. No, the other way. Okay, so it's cooler at the grill than it the is. The heat rises. Okay, okay. Um, so the one I use all the time, my my go to grill is my, my go to thermometer is called a um, a Thermoworks smoke, and we talked about it before online. Yep. Um, got two probes with it. Um, my uh, mouse is going a little crazy here. <laughs> it comes with two probes, so you can have a meat probe and a, a grill probe, or you can have two meat probes, or and then my Rec Tech has two probes built into it as well, plus a grill height temperature. So on the Rectech, I actually have three, I can do two different meat probes and the temperature of the grill measured inside the grill, plus the temperature you're setting the grill too. So and do, you, do you cook in Fahrenheit or do you cook in Celsius? Fahrenheit. Oh. The only people that... that really cook in Celsius are the UK. Okay. <laughs> they, they use Gasmark and like Gasmark 4, which is like, 300 celsius or 250 celsius which is like 500 fahrenheit yeah. so our, our temperature outside is always measured in in celsius yeah but cooking you're doing you're cooking in fahrenheit yeah okay pools you'll find people do both okay um my work thermometer is set at fahrenheit but my home thermometer is set in celsius <laughs> so we're a real mix it is a mix uh for you guys so you're probably a little bit better converting than we are you know yeah, um, I think we have to be. A Andrew says Celsius for the win. I think Justin is cooking in Celsius too. But, um, uh, but okay, none of, our, none of our stoves or anything is in Celsius, right? You, I think Europe, like North food. America, right? North America yeah. would be this in this case for cooking. North America would be in Fahrenheit, and UK, Europe, has, UK has nothing to to, to laugh at us about because they have everything is metric except for miles. Like oh, they, really? if you go over there, it's a fifty-five mile an hour speed limit. Oh, for the from their vehicles? For the vehicles. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it's crazy. Um, crazy world. Uh and then Andrew says in pints too. They yes. uh, they drink they drink in pints. So but that goes back because they've been drinking beer longer than anybody for sure. Uh, so. And that's the other thing. Like we have seven hundred and fifty milliliter bottles up here, but everybody knows they're twenty sixers. <laughs> the 26ers and 40s and Mickeys and we don't go by well that's because Canada's traditionally bought a lot of American alcohol and I think that yeah. that the that that stuff just traveled with it right and 750 worked out nicely to, tw to 26 ounces right yeah and Andrew says uh, his pints our pints are larger than yours <laughs> that's, that's super great I, I was in Prague a couple of years ago and they had liter beers at the bar. Uh, oh, oh, sign of leader beer. Oh, man. it's like a boot. 
That is like a boot of beer. Yikes. So there's, um, a brisket, there's a brisket I did up on the screen okay, now. Well, that was let me, uh, let, me, let me bring that up for you. There you go. Our Canada Day weekend. How big? How how big is that brisket? Uh, Twelve pounds. Okay. Yeah, we'll see weights weights and imperial too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That's important. The um, what? So a twelve pounder cooks down to about what? Do you think? Well, I trimmed it. When I trimmed it, it was went from twelve down to ten and a half. And we probably got about eight pounds out of it, depending on how fatty it is. And how well, long to how long to cook the brisket? That one, I would try something different. Uh, I started it at nine o'clock the night before. Uh, I had it on smoke until six o'clock in the morning, which is one hundred and eighty degrees. Um, at hundred at nine o'clock at six o'clock in the morning, I turned it from one hundred and eighty to two fifty, and then cooked it until. Two o'clock in the afternoon, and it still was it was stuck in a stall for a long time. That the 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 curve was very frustrating because it was just flat. It just it was going up by like a degree every half hour type thing. It was just not getting in temperature. So at around uh, two o'clock, I wrapped it in butcher paper and turned it to two seventy five, and it finished up around three thirty. Why? And why did you wrap it in butcher butcher paper? To try and give it a bit of a braise. Okay, it's not an overly braise. It's not sealed tight. It just it helps some of the moisture stay out, stay around to help it cook a little faster. Okay. So um, for just for heat purposes, then basically, yeah, okay. and to get some to retain some of that moisture, so it's trying to start steam it a little bit. Yeah, and do you just keep butcher paper around? I bought it for it. Okay, that's one of my many. I, I on a roll. It. Yeah. Okay. I okay. bought. Uh, I think it's a hundred yards or something. You just buy it. Them. Did you buy it at a? Where, where would you buy butcher paper? I, I mean, we on. get. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I, I think it came from the it came from the states. It was Amazon.com that shipped to Canada. Okay. Okay. Yeah, maybe so. we get it. You know, when we get our meat at Fairway here in town, yeah. we they they wrap it up in plastic and then in butcher paper. The the butcher paper is surely as, as aesthetic at that point. It doesn't. The yeah. Plastics doing the job. But um, I, I use it for brisket sometimes. I use it also um, mostly. I use it for um, beef ribs. Um, I tend to wrap my beef ribs when they're um, when they're getting close to being done. Uh. These guys, yeah. So when those are getting finished up, I'll wrap those up. So those are like seven-hour beef ribs. And w typically, so if I were to, have, for my grill, if I were to have a minimum temperature that I needed to be able to get it to at the grill level for smoking like this, what would be the minimum? Two fifty. Okay. If you if, can I, if I can get it as cool as two fifty at the grill level, indirect. Yeah. Two fifty. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, you don't need to be. The, the way you do indirect on a gas grill is you put the meat on the opposite side right. of the burner. That's what I'm yeah. So I would measure on the indirect side. Right? Yes. The, yeah. I would wherever I'm going to put the meat is where I would measure. It, but if I could get it, if I could get the temperature lower, maybe like 180 or 175, that'd be okay too. Yeah, it's going to take you a lot longer to cook. Yeah, yeah. I, I, the reason I cook at 180 on that brisket it was uh, on the rec tech when you put it to 180, you get what's called super smoke. So it varies the fan speed. Okay. So you actually hear it ramping up and ramping down, and it's generating more smoke from the pellets. Okay. Um, when you get into 250, this, that super smoke cycle doesn't work anymore. So it's the first uh, nine hours are just for smoking. Okay. At 180. So 250 would be to between two and 250 would be optimal if I were gonna it at grill level if I were gonna be able to do it off my grill. Yes. Okay. Okay. It's good. No, that's good. That gives me something to shoot for. I've got one of those. I could take one of those thermometers that I have that's that's made to go, you know, a probe that's made to go in, an eye grill. Yep. I could just set that on the grill, right? And, yeah. And, okay. One trick is to use a potato. Oh, put it in the potato? Yeah, chop a potato in half. Okay. Stick the probe through the potato and have it poking at the other side. Okay. And then how long would I run it? 20 minutes to kind of get to, to get up to temperature? Yeah, it, it's going to vary depending on the outside temperature and the wind conditions, <laughs> but it should stabilize fairly Okay, these guys can't stop talking about beer in the chat room. We're gonna need to have a show on beer. Super, we should. Well, you know, I had a guy uh, who does an alcohol. He does uh, shots of history, which is about the you know, the history of alcohol, at least especially here in the United States. And I I wanted to get him on to talk about all the technology that goes into brewing. So um, yeah, maybe at some point we'll get that uh, we'll get that done. So the brisket. Now you got some. You got some. These are beef ribs that you're showing right. Yeah. Now. 
Yeah, beef ribs are probably my favorite thing to do right now. The uh, I did some and, and why? Why the the flavor? Hmm. They're they're like um, they're like brisket. They're done in a fraction of the time. They're easy to do. They're pretty much maintenance free. Um, I did a batch as a thank you uh, to my right here. So just after Christmas, we went to um, to Mexico for a week, and our dog sitter uh, they don't like taking money for looking after our dogs, so they like our dogs. So we try and give them something in, re in return. So before I left, I did up uh, 19 pounds of beef ribs for them. <laughs> so that was filled my little my little cooker. And that's the lasagna pan. Like that's a, that's a big lasagna pan. Yeah. And they are, it filled the tray. And those, each bone is about a pound. It's delicious. Yeah. So they, we asked them when I got back and they, and they, there's, um, if you think about like, you get a steak, you get two different types of fat on it. You get some fat that renders down and gets all nice and soft and juicy and flavorful. And you get the other stuff that's almost like a grizzle that doesn't get rid of itself. This is full of the really juicy, tasty stuff. And none of the, if you trim them right, none of the, the stuff that doesn't disintegrate. So you're, uh, we had some, uh, a few months ago, we did some for some friends that came over and I warned them. I said, it's going to be a little juicy on the inside from the fat. There wasn't a single drop. Like everybody ate every single piece of meat on the bones. <laughs> There's nothing left. <laughs> it sounds it sounds delightful. How long were those in again? Tell me. Seven hours at okay. uh, two seventy five. So put them in first thing in the morning and eat them that evening, or do you cook yeah. them the day before and nope. eat them the next day? Do them same day. So put okay. them on ten o'clock, off by five. Wrap them in foil if you want to to keep them going and. Um, have in, dinner. In, in, do you have to baste them in the open? What do you do? What's the prep work that you do while those are on there? Uh, these guys, uh, I keep on clicking the wrong screen. So those, um, I use, I reference in my, in my show notes, uh, a powder called um, SPG, salt, pepper, garlic from Suckle Busters. And there's something about the garlic that they do that makes it, when it hits some moisture, it just makes it into like a garlic paste on the, on the meat. And it's just fantastic. Um, so rub those with SPG, toss them onto the grill. Because I loaded it up so much and there was some overlap, I moved them around a couple of times. But other than that, I didn't touch them. No basting, no mopping. Put them on the grill and come back seven hours later. Wow. No basting. Just let them. Just don't let them even go. turn them? I did for this one because of the fact that the, the way they're stacked, you want to make sure you get enough airflow to all the different sizes mm -hmm. of meat. Okay. So And they shrank down. So when I first put them on, the meat was actually out to the edge of the bones. Mm -hmm. So I moved them around just to my, my big grill that could have easily done them was buried under three feet of snow. I didn't want to shovel it out. My small yeah. grill, which I used from the winter was accessible, but it got filled up. So I put them on after a couple of hours and moved them around just so I had more airflow to everything. So they all got nice and, and, uh, ground. No, I'm, so I'm, I am definitely setting up a test this weekend <laughs> to, uh, to test the low point on my grill. Um, oh, by the way, in the show notes, lots of things Mark over prepped for this show. And we have a lot of recipes as well as links and some things he's been talking about. The brisket is an uh, line item there in the show notes. He's showing those to you right now on the screen. That's kind of, that's kind of what we work on. By the way, if you want to see behind the scenes of how home gadget geeks work, this is the show notes, right? Uh, that that we uh, that we do together. Tomahawk steak sounds interesting to me. I think we talked about this the last time, but what the heck is a tomahawk steak? It's a ribeye with a bone on. Okay, and it's more of a. You'll get people criticizing it, saying you just you're just going buy ribeye and it's the same thing, and it is. But it's a. Uh, so there's a bit of a story about this this one i'll show you all the pieces but this is basically a tomahawk steak that's three and a half pounds and that's the rib coming off the back side right yeah so a lot of people say well that's just a ribeye with a bone on it and you're paying for the bone and you can't eat and but it's one of those presentation pieces mm -hmm. so that was three and a half pounds it was 45 dollars um the price in the back is for rib grilling steak it was 20 dollars a pound, uh, twenty dollars a kilo, so probably ten dollars a pound. Um, but this uh, this steak is was 
let me go back a step. The bottle of wine that's in here um, was a wine that was made by a vineyard that the owner passed away. Um, and this was the last bottle that he made. And when he sold it at the vineyard, it was selling for $35 a bottle. A friend of ours donated that bottle to us for a wine auction to support a dog rescue. We sold that bottle of wine for $850 worth of tickets. It sells at home still for $1,500 a bottle if you can find it. Yeah. Um, and some friends of ours won it and they brought it down to share with us. So we'd had it when I was at the vineyard. Uh, the wine tour guy that donated it to us, we all knew. They won it on this auction and they came back to bring it to, to share it with us. So I wanted to do a very nice meal for a 15. The bottle is worth 35 bucks when it was originally made, but it's $1,500 bottle of wine now. So I said, well, if you're going to do that, I'm going to bring up a tomahawk. I'm going to do my first tomahawk. So that's the tomahawk. Um, I have better pictures of how I did it. I did two of them last year. Um, so that's the tomahawk sitting on my Rectech grill. So that takes up maybe 10% of the surface area. That grill is a huge grill. It's so six... you've got, okay, you've got tinfoil going on underneath this. Yeah, so on what, a drip what, pan. It's just a drip pan. Yeah. Basically. So the way a pellet grill works is you have your fire pot at the bottom where all the flame is and all the heat is. You have a heat deflector and then you have a drip pan okay. and then you have your grill grates. So there's no chance, there shouldn't be any chance for flame to hit grease. Mm. So, so I, you... I should think about getting a drip pan if I want to do some of this. Uh, you should really think you, about installing a drip pan? If, if you can, great, but that's just how pellet grills are designed. Okay. Yeah, I, this is a this is a traditional, you know, a gas-fired grill, yeah. and I've got heat deflectors on it. That's good enough, or should I, you should try, I try to? If, if the meat's not dripping onto the heat deflectors, you're fine. Okay. I, mean, I probably would, to be honest. But okay. The, well. the uh, pellet grills are designed like this so that you can – I did the chicken quarters a couple weeks ago. And I put the chicken quarters on and walked away and came back 45 minutes later and they're done. And there was no flare up because there's no chance for the heat to come yeah. up in contact with it. Yeah. No, no, no. And what temperature were you cooking those at? The chicken? Yeah. Uh, 300. Okay. Quarter. So pretty, pretty hot. Yeah. Okay. Now maybe, uh, I'll figure, maybe I'll figure a way to rig a drip pan under there because it does, it does, it, I don't want to say it flares up, but it's kind of messy. You know? And if you're trying to do low and slow, you don't want flare ups. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, I do get some, especially when I do bacon wrapped asparagus. I definitely yep. get flare ups at that point. So it'd be it'd be nice to put a section that had a drip pan on that. That would, right? If you're going to do bacon wrapped yeah. asparagus or something like that, bacon wrapped oh, yeah. sirloins. I can cook bacon right on this thing. Yeah, right? which is something yeah, you'd yeah. never do with a, a charcoal grill. Oh, I have. <laughs> Trust me. You, uh, you need to sit yeah. there with a spray bottle and the. You do. Yeah. But this the, this thing you just lay it. You can fill the entire thing up with bacon, and you don't even worry about it. It just the grease strips onto the drip pan goes off to the side into the bucket. So, anyways, this was uh, the beginning, I think, of a two-hour smoke. That was the end of the two-hour smoke. It got a really nice mahogany color on it. Yeah, that does look good. It looks dark. So, are you outside? Is that mean yeah. dark outside? Okay. Yeah, this is nine o'clock at night. Inside temperature on that? On uh, that? one twenty. Ooh, Fahrenheit. That's, that's pretty rare. Yeah, but it's yeah, not done cooking. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, this is caveman style. Oh. Okay. <laughs> this Got is it. right right on the coals. Yeah. This is I have Kevlar gloves. Um, I put my Kevlar gloves on. I picked the bone up, and then flipped it over and flipped it back, and it's sitting right on the coals. And uh, that freaks a lot of people out to because i've seen um steven reichland do that yeah and uh, it freaks a lot of people out to think uh, wait a minute that would be touching the, the the coals would be touching the meat right yes but it does but it doesn't stick to it right or it does to i don't the, know, talk the, about that the best the best analogy I ever heard or the best explanation I ever heard of it was from uh the guy that did good eats he's a he's a he's got short blonde hair um He's famous on the Food Network, and I can't remember his name now because I want to say it. But he said all that happens is you get this this little bit of ash that makes a wonderful gravy on the meat. <laughs> so the juice uh, the juice from the meat comes out. There's no room for the fire to start up um, between the meat and the coals because there's no room for oxygen to exist between the meat and the coals. Okay. So you don't get you get very little flare ups unless it's the outside edge of it. Um, Joe's asking this guy Fieri. It's not him. It's a guy with he has glasses. He's about his fifties. Um, 
Can can you do that on wood coals? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's what this is. This is lump charcoal. So oh, this okay. is basically wood coals. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, like, if I was, if I had just straight wood, not not. Yep. If, well, if I was cooking on wood. Alton Brown's the guy I'm thinking of. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, that's caveman style. It can be any sort of coal. I just happen to use charcoal because that's what I have. But I could easily have a, a bit of fire there, a bit of right. like a, a campfire. Okay. Wood, just regular wood. standard wood. Yep. That would be okay. okay. So that was done uh, only for like 45 seconds aside. And then you can see it's got a little bit of charring on some of the spots where there's some grizzle. Um, but that's now cooked through. I let it rest for about five minutes. Um, that was another really nice bottle of wine from a local vineyard. That served six meals. Wow. Yeah. And I think, yeah, we had that with this uh, uh, lemon parmesan uh, arugula salad. And potatoes? And roast, roast potatoes. Roasted? Oven roasted? Uh, yeah, active fry. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So this is beef rib before they went into a cooker. So the ones you saw before with the bone drip back, right. that's how they started out looking. And they shrink down to that point. So that was the same weekend. We had some friends came down. They drove about five hours down, and we we had a, a feast for a couple of nights. <laughs> uh, is it good? Or like, is that as good the second day as it is that evening? Uh, the, the steak. Yeah. Yeah. We we that. made uh, made steak fajitas. Yeah. Ribeye steak fajitas. It was it was good. Yeah. Do you? How do you? So so you have steak that you've cooked to one hundred and thirty. Just say yeah. medium 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 rare. Yep. And you want to prepare those. So you want to make them for fajitas the next day and you want to warm them up, but you yep. don't want to cook them the rest of the way. How do you do that? The, the easy way is with sous vide. <laughs> I was afraid you were going to say that, <laughs> but I've done it before when I didn't want to break up my, like I, I have a sous vide, but I have it packed away in this box. So when I don't want to have to, uh, pull break the thing out, I'll toss it in a Ziploc bag, put it in a pot of boiling water and, and keep it on a simmer. Okay. It's, it's not an accurate sous vide, but all you're trying to do is warm the meat up without. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you could. I never thought of that. I guess you could put a uh, one of those thermometers. You, you know, could use your Weber thermometer. Yeah. Just yeah. don't get the uh, don't get the end of the probe that where the wire is wet. Well, but or if you had one of those traditional meat thermometers, that yeah. was just metal, right? With the uh, with the cap on top, right? That would do that. Yep. And then turn the water till you get it to one thirty the 135 right and then just drop it in the water and let it sit for 10 minutes 20, 10 20 20 minutes yeah. maybe would Brisket. you slice it ahead of time to do we that? can or... do it or we'll fry it up with just veggies and stuff and just toss it in right near the end okay but so just getting ro like slowly rolled yeah. over yeah because you really just need it warm at that yeah. point right yeah it's already cooked yeah yeah right on right this on. video is is uh i bought a wagyu brisket and i posted the jiggle and the guy I bought it from, the, the meat supplier, actually put it on his Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram as the, this is what we want to see our customers do. <laughs> That's great. It's the, it's the wiggle. So this is something that you're, that, it, that you're looking for when you yes. explain it. So the wiggle between, on the brisket is between the, um, <laughs> somebody saying the vegetarian just left. <laughs> um, the wiggle is between the flat and the point on a brisket. So there's a layer of fat there that you want to try and keep in the brisket because it keeps it nice and juicy. Yeah. So you, when you see people actually pick up brisket and they start squeezing that out of it, um, well, I have a friend who's a barbecue competitor, and he says uh, it's one of those things that uh, somebody's just killed a little child when you squeeze the juice out of a brisket. <laughs> he, he's a serious competitor. He's he's yeah. uh, He's been grand champion, reserve grand champion. He hosts barbecue contests. He's He's serious. Yeah. Um, and he's like, why do people squeeze the juice of that wonderful juice out of the brisket? Yeah. I Leave said, it in. Are, yeah. I said, what about the jiggle? He goes, no, no, the jiggle's good. <laughs> Don't squeeze the juice out. Well, Andrew says in chat room, he says, as the chat room's token vegetarian, I have to click like on this video podcast. So he's that's impressive. Even though he's the token vegetarian, he's enjoying it as well. So there's some to me, Mark, like there's some I guess what I've been attracted to is we've been talking about this for the last couple of years and the way I keep coming back to it from, you know, people are like, well, how does this relate to a tech podcast? Well, one, I don't care, but two, <laughs> um, there's a lot of art to, as we've talked about some of the recipes you've done, I learn something new every time you guys challenge me to do new things every time. Just gadgets. 
there's just there's just a lot of art to it though as far as how you put it in and the rubs you put on it and temperature and how you cook it i mean it's a highly technical thing it's just not like you know throw the throw the briquettes in throw the meat on top let cook it till you think it's done pull it off i mean that's the way my dad barbecued you know yeah. and that was a weber weber kettle, kettle and burgers you know and and some hot dogs that you'd burn um, but it is, I've, as we've spent this time really talking about this, I've really kind of grown this appreciation for just having the right gear there to be able to do it right. And then with the, like with the tomahawk steak, sometimes you don't need the, you don't need it. Just fire it up, get the thing to temperature, then take it out and sear it right on the, you know, you can just put it right on there. You could, you could even do that in your oven, right? Yeah. You could, you could slow cook it in your oven at 200 degrees until it's 120. Take it out, put it on top of your campfire. You get somewhat the same effect. You won't get a smoke flavor, but you get the same yeah. slow roasted, wonderful, juicy piece of meat because you've, you've reverse seared it. And that could be an easy way to get into ribs too, right? Yes. To, to get them, do the ribs in the oven. Would you cover them or leave them open in convection or regular bake? Uh, the thing about ribs, if you want to get the smoke flavor, you have to smoke them first. Yeah. 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 But and just bake them. Just say you can't smoke them, but you want to have ribs. You could add, yep. you could add flavors to it other ways than smoking, right? Yeah, you, you would, can do different rubs. You can would, put liquid smoke into into a barbecue rub. You could. Um, I find I'm using a lot of um, suckle busters now for a number of my. I used to I used to make all my own rubs. I still make some of my own rubs, but you tend to make like a rub might have 15 ingredients in it. Um. If I want to just go and get something real quick that I like that's not overly salty, I'll go and buy Suckle Buster's ribs, rubs for ribs or for whatever I'm cooking. Yeah, and a lot of meat, a lot of meat markets, you can pick up rubs that way too, yeah. right? But a lot of those tend to have a lot of salt in them. Okay. Um, so oh, it's true. It's one true. trick I've learned is before, and I'll start, I like to try and layer my rubs, so I'll try and get numerous different flavors in it. So before I put any rub on the meat, I'm tasting the meat or tasting the rub to see how much salt it has in it. Cause I can, you can get away putting one salty rub on, but you can't put two on it. Okay. So if I get a salty one, then I'll look for other ones that are just the wrong ingredients. So I don't worry about salting it up. So if I wanted to do ribs in the oven, would I, would I wrap them first? You know, bring that. So you're saying oven is maybe 200 degrees, 180 degrees. What would you put? What would you, what would you start ribs at? 150? 250. 250. Yeah. Wrap them or wrap them or open. <laughs> That's another huge debate. <laughs> um, I don't like wrapped ribs. Okay. I uh, a lot of the guys that compete use do wrap, uh, do wrapped ribs. Uh, they use what's called the Texas Crutch. So they do like two two one or three two one, which is how many hours per per stage. So they'll do like on three two one, it's three hours on the grill or in smoke or in your kitchen the oven. Then two hours wrapped with juice. And they'll put more, they'll put uh, brown sugar and squeezable butter and all this other stuff on it with it. And then one hour back in the grill um, to caramelize the heat with sauce. Uh, that gives you ribs that are, um, you can pull the bone right out of them. Mm. That's not what the KCBS wants to see for a competition rib. They want to have a rib that actually has a little bit of pull to it. And I don't like ribs that the bone falls out. I want to actually have to pull the meat off the bone. Really? Yeah. Okay. But you want it to come off. You just I want it to come out. off. Okay. okay. But I don't want to do, I don't want it to fight for yeah. it, but I also don't want it. So you can just pick the rib up and the thing falls apart. Oh. And that's, a, that's, a, that's hard to get. Getting them like that. I had a set one time that took me seven and a half hours to do a set of baby back ribs, seven and a half hours at two fifty, Okay. And they were still, I had to crank up the temperature to get them done. Because there was so much meat on them. Yeah. And then the same place the following week, I had, did more ribs and they were done in five hours. And you, you knew they were done because of temperature. You do the break test. Okay. So you you pick up your ribs with your tongs and as you start to twist them, if you see the, the bark starts to break apart, yep. they're done. Okay. So you got to start seeing that when it starts to happen. Cause I do mine, I do mine all dry. And this is all personal preference. Right. Yeah. Some people sure. have it and they're like, I can't stand if they're not three, two, one ribs. Uh, my wife and I tend to like them that we do them completely dry. Um, and then the last half hour, we'll put some sauce on them. But we've even done them as simple as um, uh, salt, pepper, garlic, and lemon juice. 
So salt, pepper, garlic when you cook them, pull them out, sprinkle, uh, um, just a little lemon juice on them when you're done. Mm-hmm. Very, very simple. Mm. You know, we made, I went and got the other night, uh, my son, which is my oldest, was here. And I said, hey, uh, everybody was out of town. His wife was out of town. My wife was out of town. So I was like, you want to burn some steaks? And he said, yeah. So we went down to Fairway, picked up some bacon wrap sirloins, really good ones. We got five bucks for, for eight ounce sirloins. And they were a good price, great, great pieces of meat. I seized them, seasoned them with, with Mrs. Dash Chipotle uh, seasoning. And salt and pepper, of course. So salt and pepper, Mrs. Dash Chipotle. Uh, Mark, like I was pleasantly surprised, as simple as that was, that Chipotle seasoning added a little bit of kick to the steak at the end, just kind of a, and I didn't even tell Phil I'd done this. This is kind of the test, you know, and he was like, hey, what'd you put on this thing? And I was like a little, you know, a little, a little Mrs. Dash um, Chipotle. And he's like, dang, this is kind of good. And so I think sometimes you can even get away with a fairly simple, you know, a simple, simple seasoning, it doesn't always have to be complicated. No, if I do steaks, I only use SPG. Okay. Yeah. That's all I use, yeah. which is salt, pepper, garlic. Yeah. That's, that's it. Yeah. That well, was- typically I salt and pepper. That's for me. Yeah. Salt and pepper works just great. But, but I was, I was feeling adventurous, you know, I was like, Hey, what, what can I find here? Ooh, this looks good. I never thought about putting a chipotle little chipotle the, uh, another uh, you're going to show something else here in a second but another buddy of mine said bring the steaks cook the steaks in the oven until you get them to that one you know 120 or whatever lather them in mayonnaise Butter. yeah, no, yeah. mayonnaise yeah. like yeah. a fatty hellman's yep. or whatever and then have you done that before i've done that with chicken okay <laughs> he says it's just delightful this it, is a guy it, from uh, india by the way who was telling me this i was like hey wait a minute but uh Apparently, right that that mayonnaise, that fat will caramelize and 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 just really add to the flavor of the meat. That seems a little counterintuitive to add mayonnaise to it, but man, I got to give it a try. And also on the chicken, I have a friend who does it all the time with chicken and some other meats, but it tends to um, seal in moisture. Okay. So I had to show this. I didn't think I had a picture of it. I just found it when I was looking through the food. I did a search on Google Photos for food, and this popped up. I can't remember when we had this was a couple of weeks ago we did this. And this is two of the recipes that are on my on the show notes. So the top one is uh burnt end hot dogs. So if you ever heard of brisket burnt ends or pork belly burnt ends or this is hot dog burnt ends. So just regular hot dogs. Regular hot dogs. Okay. And you you made them that way. Yes. Okay. I did this. I I didn't make the hot dog, but I made the, the oh, dish. Right, right. Um so you basically cook the hot dogs and then you toss them in. You cook the hot dogs with rub. I think we sl- you slather them with mustard, you put r- uh, rub on them, cook them up. Then you toss them into a pan with more rub and barbecue sauce. And you let the barbecue sauce caramelize on it with, depending on the recipe, it's got brown sugar or maple syrup and honey. And, and it makes these little wonderful hot dog bites. And it's something that everybody's like, we're not doing hot dogs. on the like, what are you doing hot dogs in your smoker for? And it was amazing how many, we had this over for a party and it was amazing how many of those disappeared. Yeah. And the one in front of it is bacon wrapped spam. <laughs> and this is another one that's in the show notes. And the, the trick I put on this, I just told people, don't tell people what they're eating until they have it because they disappeared. Yeah. They're like, oh, I'm not eating spam. That's disgusting. And they take a bite and they're like, it literally melts in your mouth. It is the bacon's nice and crispy. The spam is nice and gooey, and the thing is just—it uh, was just fantastic. I, I know people who like spam today. You know, they'll they'll eat it. I I, I don't know many, but um, I think it's and I think it's gotten a little bit better. Boy, I tell you what, the spam whoever makes spam is really trying to uh, rebring back the the image of it. Go to spam.com. And uh, you can see some recipes there as well of some things that you can do with it. What does that stand for? What does spam stand for? Um, something in ham. Uh, it says sizzle pork and and mm, but that's not what it stands for. Um, I forget they they came up with it during World War II, didn't they, or something yeah. like that? Yeah. Hormel Hormel makes it the Hormel brand. It's a UK thing, and then that's how Hawaiians like it. Hawaiians like it so much because it was left over from World War II's. Um, uh rations yeah it's one of the things that could actually ship because it was uh it was it shipped easily introduced in 1937 and gained popularity worldwide after its use during world war ii 
but it's name spam for because it's two things. It's something especially, in is it the shoulder of the ham? Especially is preserved it, ham. I thought it was like shoulder and ham mixed the the pork shoulder and yeah. ham mixed together or be. something like that. Something like that. Well, yeah, or spiced ham. Maybe that's what that's what Ron is saying uh, out there as well. I don't think. I think the deal is they mixed some meats together to make it to stretch it or to take a good part and a not so not great so part. Yeah, yeah, not make so great. Big part. Longer. Yeah, yeah, or use the whole thing, right? Yeah. In those days, we were uh, we we were not uh, we were using everything uh, that came with it. So you're saying so. Sp- to to make the bacon wraps, how big of how big a chunks of spam are you using for that? So if you, you think about the size of a can of spam, um, I made cubes up, and I think I made eight per layer. So you figure out how many pieces you, if you had to if you had to top, divide the top into eight pieces. Um, special processed American meat. Yeah, that's what Joe Joe says. Special um, processed American meat. If you had to, uh, if you divide the top, the, the footprint of a can of spam into eight pieces, and just make those into cubes, so I think that those two bowls in front on the screen right now were um, two cans. So it makes it made of like sixty-five pieces or something, sixty-four okay. pieces. Okay, out of a it single was, can. Uh, no, out of two. Two cans. Okay. It was eight per layer, and I think I maybe got four layers out of a can. And then it was a, uh, a strip of bacon per can. And in, in cooking wise, what would you do with them? Just wrapped them in bacon, dusted them with rub, and put them on the on the trigger for an hour and a bit. Okay. So bacon's okay. crispy. Okay. At what temperature? Two fifty ish. Okay. Okay. Again, it's a little labor intensive to make them, but it was. And I can't remember what the event was, but we had some people over, and and they just disappeared. Yeah. Um, but it was another one. We don't tell them what you're eating until you take a bite. And then once they realized how good it was, they didn't care what was inside it. The uh, According to Wikipedia, the Oxford Encyclopedia of Food and Drink in America states that the product was intended to increase the sale of pork shoulder. Ah, got that part right. Pork shoulder, uh, which was not very po- of not a very popular cut. Uh, then... Ken, I can't pronounce his last name, brother of the company executive, won a $100 prize that year in a competition to name the new item. Hormel claims that the meaning of the name is known uh, only by a small circle of formal former uh, Hormel food executives, but popular beliefs is that the name is an abbreviation of Spice Ham. There you go. Ah, who knows? Uh, special army meat <laughs> is <laughs> what, what some call it. Uh, so spam. It's also a famous Monty Python skit. In, yes. Uh, yeah. So. yeah it was, it, we were an English family growing up, and it was all from. It was the like spam was a UK thing until I moved over here. As a consequence, it says again, as a consequence of World War II rationing and the Land Lease Act, spam also gained prominence in the United Kingdom. British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher they refer to it as a wartime delicacy. There you go. There's your international spam. More, more should I name the podcast everything you ever wanted to know about spam? About spam. <laughs> um, the picture I have up right there is is uh, I went on a state class. So that was just some pictures from the state class. That was all one class. Nice. Nice. In like a class like this, how much did it cost? 125 bucks. Okay. For an evening yep. all steak. Yep. Take some home. This one there wasn't. Uh this one there we didn't because there was enough people there to eat enough enough of the meat. Hmm. Um that was my second steak class. They they had a steak class already and then they called this came up with this one called the super steak. And it had some beef ribs and some other cuts of meat in there and pecana and a couple others. And they had actually this picture right here. That was the meat for the class. Mm-hmm. So nice. um, that was a lot of meat. Nice. Yeah, we get, looks like you got some good grilled veggies there too. Yep. And was, all the salsa and stuff that you saw were all made in class. So this salsa here is, um, I think it was a fresh maple salsa. This right here is one of my favorite. Uh, actually, that one might be chimichurri. But I have a recipe in there for uh, something called gramolata in the show notes. And it's similar to chimichurri, but it's Italian. 
and it's one of my favorite things to make when I'm having um, red meat, like a tri-tip or a tomahawk or a... Looks good. Yeah, that was, uh, again, you never walk out of those classes feeling uh, <laughs> hungry. Yeah, no, for sure. Mark, uh, as we, we're getting short on time here, uh, why wouldn't we wrap up a food? We, we've been talking about, you know, we're a home gadget geeks kind of thing. So why wouldn't we talk about a dog toy you've come across? <laughs> Uh, I thought, I thought this was pretty cool and, um, we'll Kickstarter. We'll show it on the screen here in just a second. What'd you pick up? Uh, so it's a Kickstarter for, we have a dog that's uh ball obsessed and, uh, she's home seven, eight hours a day. So, and when I say ball obsessed, she'll actually play by herself with a tennis ball for hours. She'll drop it, stare at it, pounce on it and chase it. <laughs> um, so I love tech. I love gadgets. I love my dog. So there's a Kickstarter for a ball called Gomi that lights up, makes noises, rolls away from the dog and has an app. So you can try and find it when it's done with it. The dog can chew it. You can wash it. It can go downstairs and it was 90 bucks. So I think it's USB chargeable from what I remember. So I'm going to be getting that in the next couple of weeks. Nice. Um, it's actually going to ship. Yeah. I filled up my paperwork uh, a couple weeks ago. Yeah. They raised two hundred and thirteen thousand dollars on it. Wow. What was their goal? Um do you know? No, I just know that they made it, they managed to make it. Um and I think this was also on two different places. I think it was on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Cat uh, might like that thing too. Yeah. There, actually there's a video of the cat chasing it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it might be a good uh, it's super, uh, you know, super owner laziness there of, uh, <laughs> you just go play. It's like the, it's like walking your dog on the treadmill. Yeah. <laughs> well, she is, uh, she's five years old and she's a beagle Ridgeback mix. So severe prey instinct. And, yeah. um, she can just drive you nuts. Like she, before we started tonight, she came up here and she had her ball and she tossed the ball underneath my desk. I'm like, you can't be in here right now. <laughs> but, um, extreme prey instinct and loves to play fetch mm. so this will hopefully when we get home she'll be a little more tired and we can take her for a walk because right now if we take her for a walk for two hours she's still not tired do you think you will you leave it she's she able to run free during the day i see yeah. in the house yeah and so she think you'll just play it all day uh it'll probably start and stop okay so i'm hoping she'll play it more than five minutes yeah um she tends to love balls more than any other toy yeah so um I'm hoping, I'm hoping that it'll, it'll entertain her. You have to, you have to keep us updated on, on yeah. how it goes. That's a Giving super a interesting. The what does the app do? Oh, you can find it. That's yeah, so you can find it. Yep. Uh, you can tell it. It's like a tile, right? So you can tell it uh, beep so I can know where you are. Yeah, yeah. Because it, the they'll inevitably drive it under something, right? That's kind of, and then yeah. you'll you don't find it until you're moving the couch to vacuum under it six months later. If, yeah, if, if you're if we, not, we give them Kongs every night with stuff for treats, and typically once a week we're going to the chair trying to find Kongs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Mark, thanks for for jumping in here tonight. I appreciate it. Good to catch up with you. Just a reminder: all, not all, and even actually all of what we talked about, plus more. Mark has provided in the show notes. So if you want to pop out there and uh, get some ideas of some things to do, or you know, what have you, there's some links out there. Of course, you saw Mark's pictures that's, uh, that's, that he has, and this stuff looks delicious. Mark, how long do you think you've been at this? I mean, when you think about serious grilling, how long have you been doing this? I think it's six years. Okay, so not, not terribly long. No, but six no. years and seven grills. <laughs> well, I, have, I have four grills left. But I bought seven grills over six years. Yeah. But you've been kind of growing great. into your grills, right? It's kind of, you've been buying them because you wanted different things with them, right? Yeah, it's now eight grills because I bought the Uni, which yeah. is kind of a grill. Yeah. It's, it's six or seven years. It was, because um, I was out, on, I was on vacation chatting with Mike um, Howard about grills when you saw us having a conversation on the Facebook post and you're oh, like, yeah. we need to have the start of this. We need to have a barbecue show. Yeah. So I think it was four years ago. And I think I've been grilling about two years before that. Yeah. 
No, it's good. I mean, you've really, you've really kind of done a lot of it. You've grown into it. You've taken a lot of classes around it. You've spent some time. I, I don't think, um, you know, and I'm kind of your average griller. I've got a single grill. Um, I do, I would like to pick up charcoal. So I, I just need to do that at some point. You should have bite the um, bullet. Uh, no, I know. It's just, it's so stupid about that kind of stuff. Um, so you don't have to buy four grills to be in this. You can no. you can kind of get it. You can do it in the oven, sear it differently. You can do it inside all all winter. We did steak inside this year. We did a lot of pan kind of pan steak that it's really delicious. And Gordon Ramsay's got some great videos on how to get how to butter baste a steak. It's pretty. I've great. never done that. It's super great because I, I look at it and like I can do that. Or I can fire up the Weber and just do it in the charcoal. No, I know, but uh, it's pretty. When it's cold outside, or you just don't want to go outside, like it's a million freaking degrees out there right tonight. Yeah. Um, pretty great to do it in cast iron. You know, yeah. cast iron. That's one of my favorite. That's still one of my favorites to do. Yeah, in a good pork chop, a of a, 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 you know a a um, cast iron cooked pork chop is really good. That fat. And I have cast iron. I have yeah. I inherited my mother's cast iron uh, fry pan from the seventies. Yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, a way to do it. I just tend to do a lot more outside. And as far as the the gas, I'm not allowed to have a gas grill anymore. I've been uh, barred from having a gas grill at Why? home. Why? Why? Because my wife loves the flavor of wood and charcoal. Oh, uh, yeah, it is pretty great. So she, after having that, she's like, nope. I looked up buying just a small one. She's like, nope. You want to do burgers? It's so easy. It's so easy, though. Just turn it on. Well, I do that for the Traeger. Yeah. Oh, true. If I'm, true. Doing, if I'm cooking on the Traeger, if I'm doing yeah. sausages and burgers, walk up to the Traeger, you turn the dial to 375, the thing fires up like a like a steam engine, Yeah. and then you toss the things onto it, and you have no flare-ups, and you have no... Uh, it's just the smoke. The, yeah. the cloud of smoke on, on a... The cloud of smoke on a startup of a pellet grill is my dad saw it the other day and he's like, your neighbors must really like you. <laughs> <laughs> it lasts for about 30 seconds, but for yeah. 30 seconds, you can't see the backyard. Yeah. You can't see the deck. It just covers the entire deck in the cloud of smoke. Oh, that's great. And it all rolls away. And it's just, it's burning. It's that initial combustion. It's getting the wood up to the point of flashover where it can actually start igniting itself. And it just smokes a lot for that first couple minutes. So, Pretty cool. Sounds good to me. So, Mark, thanks for thanks for coming in. Hang tight for yep. just one sec. Let me close some things out. If you came out tonight, I want to thank you for, for doing that as well. A couple of reminders coming up. Edward Weniger is back next week, coming on to kind of catch us up on Bitcoin and all things blockchain. And so he's been doing some interesting things. I felt like where the markets were going with Bitcoin, it might be worth uh, spending some time chatting about it. It's, uh, we won't do a post-show tonight on that, but... Um, been interesting interesting couple weeks big 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 uh, ups and big downs and um and so Ed edward will be back to talk about that mike is back uh next week as well but then uh aaron lawrence is coming back uh mark i think you're gonna like the show she bought you know this custom well no she bought this van, van and has custom the whole thing and it's gonna be sweet like i'm super pumped for this show she's back on the 8th of august to talk about that uh, and so that should be a really good show. Aaron's just great no matter what. And so it'd be good to have her back. And then uh, Micah is joining us again on the 15th. Uh, she's been doing a lot of research around office chairs. Like she does spend a lot of time sitting and stuff. And I think that's one of those tech items. Maybe we don't spend a lot of time thinking about as the chair. I know Mike Howard spent a lot of time just sitting on a folding. I couldn't believe he did this. He used to podcast for hours on a folding metal chair. And I was like, Mike, what are you doing? Like, what are you, what are you doing? Stop doing that. I think she ended up spending about 300 bucks. Office chairs can be super expensive. You know, you can do the office max or office depot. I mean, they're three times more expensive in Canada because that's what everything is. But, you know, we can do an office chair for about 60 to a hundred dollars for the real cheap ones. And then the, the, just the decent ones are 300 bucks or more. So yeah, they get the same. Yeah. Okay. So Mike is going to come in. She did a bunch of research around that. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, office furniture around using it for tech because we spend so much time sitting down. I'm going to probably bring some research that we've done on standing desks as well during that 
time and we'll spend a little time talking about the technology that goes into the office. Don't forget, you can support us on Patreon if that's what you, what you want to do. The average guy.tv slash Patreon gets you there if you want to join us. Five dollar plans, and I'll send you one of our green 3D printed home gadget geeks coins. If you support us on Patreon at the five dollar level, get those mailed out to you. And thank all of those who did that. They've already received theirs. If you support us on Patreon. And appreciate you guys doing that. Uh, I appreciate Justin because I said, hey, do you want one, Justin? He's like, look, it's not even worth it to mail it that far. <laughs> so it, it does. It is helpful in the United States. I could probably get it to Canada as well. Uh, Ron ships them from Canada. But uh, appreciate you guys doing that as well. Don't forget, if you have any, if you want to update us in some way, you got an idea, something you want to talk about, an email, some follow up on Jim at the average guy dot TV gets gets us there. Don't forget that the average guy.tv platform, both web and media hosted, powered by Maple Grove Partners, gets secure, reliable, high speed hosting from people that you know and you trust. And you know that's Christian. And so we appreciate his sponsorship of the show and Maple Grove Partners. Get more information and plans that start as little as $10 a month. Super cheap to get a lot. MapleGrovePartners.com. All one word, MapleGrovePartners.com gets you that way as well. Don't forget to download our app if you haven't done it on your iPhone or Android. That way you always have it if you're on the road on a Thursday night and you want to listen live or you're stuck somewhere and you just want to stream it. HomeGadgetGeeks.com gets that done as well. We'll forego the HelloFresh segment since all we did was talk about food. Uh, just if you want to join HelloFresh, let me know. I've got a coupon to get you free for a week. We are live every Thursday, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern, out here at theaverageguy.tv slash live. We talk about what's coming up. We're excited for it. Mark, thanks again for being on the program. I appreciate it. We'll be back next Thursday um, with Edward. And so with that, we'll say goodbye, everybody. Good night.